Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, just for a little housekeeping, uh, if you would like to put your uh, audio on mute so that we don't hear any background sounds, I unplugged my, my landline so it doesn't work. So and I don't have a dog or cat or anything like that. But thank you. Um, but yeah, gosh, it's already Tuesday, October 5th. I'm Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And thank you for joining us tonight. Like I said, I'm sure there's going to be a few more folks joining in. And uh, we have several announcements that I want to make. Um, and uh, so we're going to just move right along. So Michelle, if you'd next slide, please. And again, welcome everyone. Um, I can't believe that things are so dark outside and it's only around 7.30. Oh my goodness gracious. But, uh, you know, the days get shorter. Fall is, is a really beautiful season. I hope everybody's prepared. Maybe you've got some pumpkins you've already purchased and gourds and made some, I made some applesauce the other day. It was, it's delicious. All right. Um, we've got a couple things. Uh, I want to remind everybody about membership renewal, um, the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, the Fall Gathering, uh, the need for a Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters representative from Western Cuyahoga, and I also want to talk about Christmas bird count. Yep, uh, I can't believe I'm talking about Christmas bird count, but this is the time. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please don't forget that it is membership season, and even though we accept memberships throughout the year, we like to get them uh, in early in the fiscal year so you don't miss out on events and activities. Um, so the membership year actually runs from September 1 through August 31st, and memberships do begin at $20, as you can, as you can see, for student or limited income. 40 for individuals, 55 for nonprofit and families, 150 for business, uh, 300 as a sustaining, and 750 for benefactor. And you can make the payment through PayPal or by check. And if you go to the Western Cuyahog Audubon site, which is www.wcaudubon.org, uh, then you will find the button for membership, and you can just click on that. So. Uh, we hope that you either either renew or become a new member and maybe have somebody join you to become a new member. Next slide, please. And COAC, the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, this is a consortium of several of the Audubon chapters in Ohio. Not all are represented. Some uh, are, are just have so few people uh, as board members, they just cannot and, uh, attend. So this is what COAC is all about, is trying to bring together all the Ohio chapters and assist in getting everybody back on track. But, and th this is done through gatherings. There is a spring gathering and a fall gathering. So next slide, please. So the fall gathering of COAC, the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, will be held on Saturday, uh, October 16th. And originally the gathering was going to be held in person in Columbus, but with COVID still around, the, the event ha has been changed to a Zoom meeting. And it runs from 9 in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon. Of course, there's a lunch break. And the attendance is free. So for the fall gathering, uh, simply go to the uh, COAC website, which is easily www.councilOAC.org. Uh, you will see the agenda for the uh, event and the, the place to register. Uh, so again, it's free. Um, Ken Kaufman will be one of the main speakers. There'll be several uh, folks from other chapters talking about volunteering and some of the other uh, things that, that um, will, again, try to bring all the chapters together and talking. So uh, we hope you can attend uh, either all of the day or part of the day. Always important. And thank you. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned, that Western Cuyahoga needs a representative to attend COAC meetings, uh, either in person or 
uh, via Zoom. And right now we are doing Zoom meetings. They are one hour long. Uh, usually the second Tuesday of the month. Um, and then, again, all the Audubon chapters that are part of COAC, uh, board members uh, do uh, attend these meetings. Um, as a representative, it would be important to report information from Western Cuyahoga to the COAC group and then reporting uh, the information from COAC back to the Western Cuyahoga board each month or at least sending notes uh, as to what has happened during that meeting. Um, we'd like the representative to be able to attend, to attend the spring and fall gatherings, which again may take place virtually or in person. We're hoping the spring uh, 2022 will take place in person. They take place around the state uh, and uh, like I say, the uh, fall gathering will be via Zoom and please register if you would like to become a representative and or attend and just see what it's all about and then you say yes I want to become a representative that's even better and of course the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Board will get the representative updated on COAC and WCAS information so we're not just going to throw you in cold we will we'll work with you uh, so we hope that we can get somebody to step up thank you for that too next slide Oh, doesn't that picture look lovely? Look at that snow. Look at that people bundled up. Well, we'll be we'll be getting to that very shortly. But this is uh, a photo from the Christmas bird count of 2020 uh, along the Lake Erie shore, and the Christmas bird count for 2021 will take place on Sunday, December 26th. And it'll, it can, you can uh, do it all or part of the day. There'll be a lot more information coming out in our newsletter and on our website. But we're going to have a uh, Christmas bird count virtual kickoff on Monday, December 13th at 7. In that virtual kickoff, we're going to talk about how you, how you participate, um, what our count circle is like, uh, what the different areas we need coverage. And we'll even do some bird identification, maybe some of the tougher species, house finch versus purple finch, things like that. And then, of course, after the count, once I get all the data in, then we're going to have a Christmas bird count wrap-up on Monday, January 10th at 7. And that will be, uh, you know, people will send in photographs, we'll have participants uh, talk about their, their time at, uh, during the Christmas bird count. We'll go through the list that we have accumulated at that time. Whether that list will be complete or not, uh, it's hard to say. It depends on how the data comes in. And um, last year, we did a bang-up job. We had lots of people out. We had, uh, we did, I think, the best we've ever done with birds. And a lot depends on people going along the lakefront for gulls and ducks. But it also depends on people walking around your neighborhood and backyard. You just never know what you'll see around your neighborhood. All right? So we hope that you can join us for the Christmas bird count information. And again, more will be coming out through blogs, through our website, and our newsletter. Next, please. And Michelle, there you go. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Broches. I'm board member and field trip co-coordinator for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And um, today I'm going to be covering the second Saturday bird walks and report the Tremont bird walks, virtual field trips, evening bird walks, and a, a little blurb about social media and how you can connect with us online. All right, uh, so the second Saturday bird walk, please join us on October 9th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trail. Bill Dininger, Dave Grass Kemper, and Ken Gober will be leading the walk.
All right, so this past second Saturday was held on September 11th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says that we had a wonderful morning for the second Saturday of the month bird walk for September 2021. 29 birders observed 43 species. It was a sunny, warm day with temperatures starting at 61 degrees and ending at 75 degrees. We were treated with three red-shouldered hawks soaring overhead, rose-breasted grosbeaks were heard and seen in several locations. Best highlight of the day were seven warbler species with a high count of four magnolia warblers. All right, in partnership with the Tremont West Development Corporation, we are hosting monthly bird walks the fourth Saturday of the month starting at 9 a.m., meeting at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue. Uh, from here, we bird the Ohio and Erie Canal uh, Towpath Trail towards Scranton Flats. And Nancy Howell is leading this month's walk. This past Tremont bird walk was held on September 25th and led by Julie West, Nancy Howell, and Marianne Romito. The group enjoyed fall-like weather and sighted a total of 33 species, including double-crested cormorant, red-tailed hawk, peregrine falcon, northern mockingbird, and common yellowthroat. And as you can see on the screen, a picture of the northern mockingbird seen um, on that walk taken by Sean Sig. All right, now for the virtual field trip. So last month, our virtual field trip was held at the Headlands Dune State Nature Preserve in search of fall warblers. The virtual meetup, during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird list, takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on October 13th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by end of day Friday this week. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, October's virtual field trip takes place at your favorite or local cemetery in search of sparrows. During your visit to the cemetery, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, WC Audubon, and clicking the field trips tile and then field reports 2021. All right, our evening bird walks. So the evening bird walks are perfect if you need a nice walk to wind down from the day or enjoy the birds that are active in the evening. Uh, these walks are held on the third Wednesday of each month, each taking place at a different location. Since sunset is beginning to be earlier, we have updated the start time of these walks to 6 p.m. Uh, this month, the walk takes place at the Lagoon Picnic area of Rocky River Reservation and will be led by Nancy Howell and myself. We will be looking for birds perched in dead trees uh, please register by clicking the Evening Bird Walks tile on the WC Audubon homepage. And this will be our last Evening Bird Walk of the year due to the sunset happening earlier and earlier. We will start these back up in the spring. All right, um, and this past Evening Bird Walk uh, took place at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve on September 15th, and we had a great turnout with a little over 20 people. 31 species were reported along with one coyote. Uh, we also had some warbler activity that was really fun. American Red Star, Cape May, Magnolia, Yellow, Nashville, Common Yellow Throat, and Wilsons were all seen. Uh, lastly, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded, like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned, uh, and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so please be sure to subscribe. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, really, please uh, try to attend an evening walk, a second Saturday walk. We've got great leaders, and it's just great fun. Uh, just can't say enough about it. All right. Uh, Drina Nemes is our uh, book um, curator, I would guess. And Drina ha has a wonderful 
series of books that she's going to be chatting about, especially the one that is going to be our book discussion coming up. So, Drina. Hello, everybody. Yes. This year, we're looking, we're, we're going a little bit into some fiction and historical uh, fiction and nonfiction. And the first book we're reading, I'm glad to tell you I learned how to pronounce her name. It's Geraldine McCochran, and I learned it on her website, which is very interesting, and uh, see that she has written many books. But this is such an intriguing story, and it's also a little bit unsettling. I think you'll find it a page turner. And our main character is Quill, and we learn a lot about Quill and all the, the boys and the men who make this trip to the warrior island, which is essentially all rock. But they have their adventures there, and we become part of it. So uh, just a little bit of detail then. We meet two weeks from tonight. It'll be at 7 p.m. And you can register, and we appreciate if people register. You can register at the uh, Audubon Society webpage. And you can get the book at Amazon. I didn't find it in the Cuyahoga County Library system. So I didn't check other local library systems, but it wasn't in the Cuyahoga. But it should be. Next slide, please. So I just want to tell you a little bit that we have a connection with birds and we find out how crucially important birds are to this community which was uh, about the late 1700s, just before 1800, in the very northernmost islands off of Scotland. And gannets, which is the uh, white bird in the picture there, and then their chicks, which are called gugas, their chicks are so important in the story. Uh, next to this picture we see, unfortunately, unfortunately this is extinct, it's the great auk, and it was three feet tall. And so that becomes part of the story too. Next slide, please. And then the stormy petrel. You've got to read the book to find out how important the stormy petrel is to the whole story because of its composition of oil. And then also puffins, these beautiful birds which served as a, an unbelievable source of food for the, for the people in this, not only in this story, but in this area of Scotland. So I hope you... Uh, we'll mark it on your calendars to join us and for uh, our first book discussion. Thank you. If there's another slide, okay, yes. Yeah. So also then um, we'll be reading The Feather Thief and uh, The Silent Spring coming up in the, in the next year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Drina. Um, now, people have to register for the book club, is that correct? We appreciate it, but they don't have to. Okay, wonderful. Very good. Well, those, those sound exciting. Um, they are. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that, and I'm glad you didn't tell us the ending. <laughs> <laughs> so, wonderful. Well, I'm back again, as you can see from the slide. And yes, we've got, I've got a few more announcements, and then we're going to get into our program. Next slide, please. Um, we had a very successful Bluebird Box program, only five Bluebird Boxes, but successfully fledged, uh, I believe, 10 young, and uh, then some tree swallows. Uh, yes, we were careful not to allow house sparrows, which are a non-native invasive and sometimes uh, destructive species to bluebirds, uh, but they were, uh, again, monitored by volunteers, and so we're still uh, asking donations for the uh, bluebird project through the Jean Miskey Memorial Fund. We would like, we meaning Western Cuyahoga, would like to expand our bluebird program. Right now, again, the five boxes are in the Rocky River Reservation. 
uh, at the Lewis Road Riding Ring off of Lewis Road. Uh, but, you know, you might know of an area that is good for bluebirds. Uh, it could be a college campus. It could be um, the edges of a, a, a golf course. Um, so bluebirds like open areas, shorter grass, some scattered trees. Um, so, again, think about it. Take a look at our website, and I think you'll get a lot more information about our bluebird project. Next, please. Ah, yes, our, the tilth soil. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about this this evening. Um, again, it's produced from composted, primarily plant-based food waste, um, made in Cleveland by, via the Rust Belt Riders. And the proceeds will benefit Western Cuyahoga Audubon. It is wonderful soil. There's three different types. Grow for your plants in the garden house for house plants and sprout for new plants, but it's an all-purpose soil as well, too. So you can order that uh, before October 10th at, through our homepage button. If you like gardening, if you like house plants, and you like the environment, again, you're going to figure out why uh, after our presentation tonight. Uh, next, please. And of course, um, along with soil, you have to have coffee, right? Oh, no, I know. After you plant your plants, then you come in for a nice cup of coffee. And yes, Western Cuyahoga also offers um, shade-grown, sustainable, bird-friendly coffee. Um, it is the only brand, uh, it's called Birds and Beans, the only USA brand that is 100% certified by the Smithsonian uh, Bird-Friendly uh, Organization. Um, and again, please order before October 10th. Uh, get our homepage, and you'll see the coffee order button, or the store button, I'm sorry, the store button. Next, please. Now, we still have a photography contest. We did not have any entries in September, but our contest for October is uh, featuring the wood duck. So take some photographs of wood ducks, males, females, kids, whatever, uh, and get that, get those photos into us. So the winner will be announced at the uh, member meeting on November 2nd. We'll sh highlight your, your photograph. There are youth and, and adult categories. And then uh, those who have entered are eligible for, for uh, prizes. And we uh, appreciate the donations for the photo contest because, of course, it supports Western Cuyahoga Audubon uh, Conservation. So, again, visit our homepage. Next. All right, soil, coffee, ice cream, and take some photographs. Well, we, we still have a few uh, Mitchell's uh, gift cards as, as a fundraiser. They are $10 denominations, and uh, we can either send, them, send those cards to you through the mail or hand deliver them. Um, we, the Mitchells ha offers not only ice cream, but frozen yogurt, sorbet, and vegan ice cream. So we hope that uh, you will consider, again, maybe, maybe though, that pumpkin, I don't know, do they have pumpkin spice at Mitchells right now? Everybody seems to have pumpkin spice, right? All right, so again, think about, again, uh, getting a gift card, perhaps as a gift, giving one as a gift. Um, we'd love to have your support. Next, please. Aha, we're getting down to the wire here. Next month, on Tuesday, November 2nd, we are going to have Dr. Kaya Provost, who is at The Ohio State University, and she is using the Bohr Lab of Bioacoustics. What does that mean? Bird songs, or actually nature songs, but she is really using, utilizing the bird songs that the lab has. And she will share with us, what do we do with all this song data? And she will go over um, you know, what is in the lab, plus the research that she's doing on white-crowned sparrows. So we hope that you can join us on Tuesday, November 2nd. Remember, our meeting start at 7.30 with announcements, and then the speaker at 8 o'clock. Next, please. And of course, this evening, 
I just can't wait for this. I've seen this presentation, or at least part of this presentation, by Rust Belt Riders Dan Brown, and it's fascinating. You know, you, you think about Audubon as a bird organization, but of course we're, we're into nature, we want to protect the environment, and you would not think that a composting program would be an important uh, component to protecting the environment, reducing carbon, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint. And I, I just really want you to, to be aware of what is going on in Cleveland, the entrepreneurship that we have happening right here in Cleveland. So I am going to introduce Dan Brown, the co-founder of Rust Belt Riders and Tilt Soil. And I, I can't wait to hear this again and more information. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Um, I'm Dan. I'm one of the founders of Rust Belt Riders. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the work that we do. Um, and I think that the work that you all do at the Western, uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society is integral to protecting and supporting ecosystems and biological uh, systems. And uh, well, it might not be obvious how a composting organization and a birding organization um, are aligned. I think that we are very interested in how we can continue to protect and preserve um, natural ecosystems. And so I hope to sort of talk about how uh, the work that we're doing and how we see ourselves as trying to do a bit of that work. And hopefully if we're successful, you all will be more successful and your success will make our success easier and round and round we should go. Um, so um, I'd like to begin by sort of presenting uh, the idea that we really view ourselves as a climate solution organization. Um, well, I think most people think about Rust Belt Riders, for those that know us, as a composting organization. We are very quick to draw the line uh, between our work and the work of addressing the global climate crisis. And that line is always not always obvious to people. Um, but a report that came out a few years back called Project Drawdown um, helped for us to really clarify and, and see just how important um, in many ways the work it is that we are doing um, in not only slowing but reversing climate change. So Paul Hawken uh, famously was one of the lead science advisors to Al Gore when he was doing his research for An Inconvenient Truth. Um, and he, along with a team of scientists all over the globe, published this report called Project Drawdown, which was trying to reframe how the public and elected officials and communities um, can think about what it is they're doing to um, address climate change. And the, the only rule they set for themselves was that they wanted to look at what were the levers that presently exist that require no additional techno technological innovations or um, technological breakthroughs that we could implement at scale um, that would begin presenting uh, solutions to the climate crisis. I think that oftentimes um, scapegoating or perhaps finding fault with things is the easier thing to do, right? It's very easy to sort of castigate big oil and big corporations for the damage that they cause and continue to cause uh, in exacerbating climate change. But I think people are far more hard pressed to understand what tools are readily accessible to them to in their daily lives um, and at a community scale begin thinking about uh, what levers we have access to. And so they took a sector by sector approach to this work and found that the food and agricultural system actually contains within it some of the greatest opportunity for leverage and for change. Um, I think this is noteworthy for a number of reasons, um, not least of which is that um, food and our agriculture system was not mentioned once in An Inconvenient Truth. Um, and I think that that left a lot of people um, feeling in many ways disassociated or not seen as being connected to the work of addressing climate change. Um, a thing that I like to point out is that, you know, if, if you can only be seen as a climate activist if you drive a Tesla, um, 
that is a very small uh, and rather elite group of people. Um, if instead you also have to somehow erect solar panels or a wind turbine, um, that pitches a pretty narrow tent um, when what I think the, the bigger challenge that we need to be taking on is to pitch a very big tent so that many more people can see themselves as being climate activists and are working on the, the solutions that we need at the pace and at the scale that we need to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change. And so um, food for me is this very egalitarian, very democratic, very um, approachable thing that we can, we all interact with, right? We all eat, we all buy or grow our own food. Um, and how we do that um, is, is one of the biggest levers that exists globally in, in reducing our, our climate impact. Um, and so when they took a step further and began to say, what about the food system is, can be improved? Um, and they, they found that reducing food waste um, was the single greatest point of leverage that we have as a global community to slowing and reversing climate change. I think that rightfully so, a lot of attention has been given to eating a plant-rich diet, reducing the amount of meat that we consume just because of the energy, land, and water intensivity that comes along with eating animal protein. Um, but I think that it came as a shock to a lot of people to see that food waste is, is even more of a significant lever. And I think that the reason for that is because food waste uh, – occurs in rather innocuous ways and in at a massive, massive scale. Um, and the impacts of food going to landfills is rather detrimental. So, um, so just for those not aware, and, you know, I count myself among those uh, until, you know, prior to starting this work, um, rough, in the United States, roughly 40% of all of the food that is grown will end up thrown away. Um, so we have a food system that has baked into the cost of our food, uh, throwing away 40% of it, right? So I like to invite people to consider, would you ever go to the grocery store, buy 10 bags of food, and just leave four in the parking lot, right? That's the kind of food system that we are exist existing in today. And that, for me, um, really points to three distinct um, challenges that we, as a culture and as a, a community need to grapple with. Um, so, you know, from from a, a purely ethical standpoint, right, we have people in our community that do not have access to healthy, nutritious food. Um, we have a, we live in a community where one in five children is food insecure, which means they don't know when their next nutritious meal will be coming. Um, so there's a there's an ethical dilemma and a moral dilemma around this broken food system. Um, there's an economic cost to this broken food system as well. Um, we will spend uh, something on the range of 218 billion dollars annually on the growing transportation and disposal of food that's never consumed. Um, that's like 1.4 percent of our GDP um, that is wasted, um, and then. Uh, on top of that, when food goes to landfills, it, em it emits methane due to its inability to properly decompose. Uh, and the emissions that result from food going to landfills would make it globally the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, only behind the economy of the United States and China. Um, methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas that on a 15-year time horizon is something like 250 times as toxic as CO2, and on a 100-year timeline is 25 times as toxic. So at this really um, precious moment and, and sort of precipice that we find ourselves in, um, mitigating methane emissions could never be important because what we do in the next, you know, five to ten years um, could be the, the difference between um, runaway climate change and being able to rein in the very worst impacts of climate change. And so methane is a particular uh, greenhouse gas emission that we need to be very mindful of in, in limit, limiting its emissions. And so 
with those th three things in mind, another mind-boggling fact is that food and other compostable material is the single largest component of what makes up our landfills. Um, and all of this can go unacknowledged and unnoticed in our daily lives for a variety of reasons, not least of which is because of how disassociated and disconnected many of us are with where our food comes from, who grows it, where it's grown, uh, seasonality, things like this. Um, and as you all are maybe more attuned to due to your, your interest in migratory patterns, right, um, I think that this invitation to re-examine our connection with natural systems uh, is one that uh, prompts asking questions and prompts mindfulness and, and I think better um, consumption patterns that uh, should ultimately result in a, a lower carbon food system, a healthier food system. Uh, and, and our work is really trying to invite that kind of thoughtfulness uh, when we're at our best. And so um, we, we provide solutions to what we view as a rather silly problem, right? So food waste um, is as damaging as it is because of how massive it is. But there are some really simple things that each and every one of us can be doing today, um, sorry about that, um, to minimize the amount of food waste that we produce in a day, week, month, or year. Um, so things as simple as meal planning, uh, understanding the difference between best buy and use by dates, eating seasonally, um, not being concerned with the aesthetics of your produce, but instead being more concerned with the nutritional qualities. These are all things that we invite all of our clients to do um, because we fundamentally would like to see our business not exist. Um, and by that I mean, if food waste didn't exist, and we hope that there is a future where we can greatly diminish the amount of food waste that exists, services like ours might not be necessary. Um, and I think that that is sort of an implicit challenge that we have to ourselves, which is to say, um, listen, we acknowledge that food waste occurs, right? If you just look at this pineapple, for example, there's lots you can do with this pineapple, but the exterior might not ever be all that appealing to eat, to pickle, to ferment, um, you name it. But when you have that top of your pineapple, we want to make sure that people have a viable alternative to the landfill for that pineapple top. Because sending that to the landfill quite literally could be the difference between runaway climate change and a habitable planet. Um, and so the work that we do um, is really attempting to provide solutions to those who are um, knowingly or unknowingly producing a lot of food waste. And so um, through research that uh, others have done and we have uh, learned from, roughly 43% of all food waste in the United States occurs at the household level, while another 40% occurs at the business or organizational level. And so it's those two groups that we really seek to aim and serve through our services. Um, and this might come as a surprise, right? But I mean, a thing I ask people to consider is, you know, last time you went out to eat, you brought home leftovers. Did you make a plan to eat those leftovers or did they sort of sit in the back of your refrigerator? Um, another example is, you know, you're at the grocery store and you see what appears like a deal, buy one, get one arugula, right? Um, but you might only get through that first package of arugula before the second one starts rotting in the back of your refrigerator. And so those little things like meal planning can go a long way in helping households minimize their food waste. Um, but for, for businesses, um, I'm thinking of like coffee shops or breweries or restaurants who are often uh, preparing lots and lots of meals or beverages uh, for lots and lots of people. There's just a higher concentration of that kind of waste at fewer locations. Um, and so what we tried to do is to devise uh, services similar to that of like a recycling company um, to provide these two sectors with alternatives to landfill that can make a positive impact on their uh, community, support a local small business, um, and meaningfully combat climate change. And so the way that that works is we, we, I'll first talk about our, our business services. And so 
we like to say that we've got a sort of turnkey solution for organizations of really any size. We work with um, organizations as large as the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve um, to as small as an architecture firm that literally has three employees, right? So if people are eating, uh, drinking tea or drinking coffee at an office um, or preparing thousands of meals for thousands of people seven days a week, um, we try and make sure that we've got a solution for you so that you can maximize your diversion of food from going to landfills. And so the way that that works is we first start by doing what we call a waste audit, which in, invites people to try out our services for one week at no cost. Um, this is very often the first time that lots of people or businesses have attempted to do this kind of practice, and there's a bit of a learning curve to it. Um, I think that we found um, the learning curve is initially steep, but once you start segmenting food from landfills, you realize it's not all that dissimilar from segmenting plastic or glass from landfill. So if we like to think that if, you, if we embraced this almost universal change of a blue bin existing in every household and at every business um, in the 60s and 70s, we can introduce a green bin uh, in our community to normalize food waste diversion. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, there's lots of hesitation and skepticism around composting to begin with. And so some of the things that we really emphasize through our work is that we know that this needs to be an exceedingly clean service. Um, lots of concerns are raised about will this attract pests or will it smell bad? Um, and so our service uh, anticipates and tries to solve for that in a number of ways, not least of which is that we, we line all of our containers with uh, compostable bags. Um, and then at the point of collecting these bins, we're actually exchanging full bins for clean, empty bins. So a thing that I ask people <laughs> to, to consider is, do you know the last time that you uh, power washed with biodegradable soap your garbage can that you put out on your tree lawn on a weekly basis? I doubt that that happens at least weekly, uh, but if it does, you're probably far cleaner than the vast majority of us. And so we, we know that making the service uh, clean is really, really important. But another thing that we know is that we, this is a time-sensitive material in a way that glass or aluminum is not. You don't want banana peels and uh, citrus sitting around in a dumpster on a hot summer day any longer than it absolutely has to. And so we, uh, we additionally think of ourselves as a bit of a logistics company because we need to be very responsive and anticipate our clients' needs for them so that their bins are never overflowing and that their bins are never producing unpleasant smells or odors, uh, and instead we can, can be there in a very timely fashion. And then the last thing that we try and emphasize to all of our commercial accounts is the community benefit that they're making through the use of this service, and we do that by weighing and inspecting every container that we collect and tracking the, that data and those metrics for them uh, for either internal reporting or uh, external marketing uh, so that they can brag about the work that they're doing. And so we've seen this be um, deployed in a number of really interesting and creative ways. Um, we've seen businesses use this, use this as a recruiting tool to attract young talent that wants to work for a purpose and mission-driven organization. We've seen others use it to embed in global sustainability reporting. We've seen some organizations use it to make sure that their building or facility becomes LEED or Energy Star certified. Um, all of this data we hope to put in the hands of people who can find ways to broadcast and really brag about what they're doing. And it's that kind of value that we try and create for our clients um, so that they can really um, more measurably understand and realize the benefits of this kind of intervention, uh, given that there presently aren't any tax incentives, laws, or government mandates that are, are 
encouraging them to embrace this kind of practice. The um, other uh, service that we offer is to residents, so people like you and me. Um, and so the longest running uh, service that we have offered to residents is our community drop-off uh, program. And so just like our, um, our commercial services, our, as well as all of our residential services, there is a cost to this because, as previously mentioned, um, governments are not doing this work and their deferral of uh, taking on some of these services um, has created a, a sort of unmet demand for these kinds of practices. It's our long-term ambition to more thoughtfully partner with municipalities and elected officials so that the communities that are using these kinds of practices and the businesses that are embracing these best practices can, can either have cost defrayed or fully deferred um, by working directly with us in the same way that most municipalities or businesses contract with uh, public-private partnerships. And so this community drop-off program, I think, is a, a sort of uh, pilot program for what that might look like at scale. So at present, we have around uh, 16 community drop-off locations across Northeast Ohio. Um, and if you're interested in where um, those are located, I invite you to check out our website, which is uh, www.rustbeltriders.com. Um, we've been adding these fairly aggressively, and we are, our aim is to have at least one drop-off location in every distinct community in Cuyahoga County within the next two years. Um, and so the, the way that this works is people opt into this program, pay a monthly fee, and then um, much like a used clothing donation bin or something like this, um, we invite you to collect your food scraps at home, put them in a container or receptacle. You can think uh, a Tupperware bin or a five-gallon bucket, really whatever works best for you. And then uh, on an as-needed basis, visit a conveniently located drop-off location that's closest to your home. And using the four-digit combination that we give to our members, you simply drop off your food scraps, empty your bin, rinse and repeat. Um, and so this provides sort of a, a really low touch, um, hopefully low cost, uh, alternative to landfills for household food scraps. Uh, we also try to build a community around this because while a lot of people who use this program might have shared values, they don't necessarily always have the opportunity to convene or to meet one another so that we can build a broader movement and broader dialogue around this work. And so we uh, host monthly workshops um, that are free to all of our pickup or drop-off members. Um, and then additionally, if you're a pickup or drop-off member, you get discounts on the aforementioned tilth soil products. So we want this closed loop system to be able to be accessed by all of our members. So um, if you're contributing banana peels and, and coffee grounds to our drop-off program, we want you to get the resulting products from that. Um, so that we can continue to um, build these uh, systems where inputs become outputs and outputs become inputs. Um, but during COVID, um, perhaps not surprisingly, lots of people started working from home. Uh, people fled the office and came home and became very bored. Uh, <laughs> but we, we also sort of have this emerging era of convenience where everything's coming to your door, um, things get delivered to you, whether it's meals or Amazon packages or you name it. So we figured we could, we might be able to do something similar. So we have a more narrowly defined service area for our, our pickup service, but the way that this works is very similar to like the milkman of yesteryears, right? You receive a five gallon bucket, just like the one pictured here. Um, we invite you to put all your household food scraps in there over the course of one week. And then on a weekly basis, you put that out on your front step or at a accessible location for somebody on our team to come by and swap out that full bin for a clean empty bin. Um, and just like our, um, our commercial accounts, uh, people who use our pickup program have access to a real-time dashboard where they can track um, the impact that they're making through the use of our services. So you can see things like uh, total pounds diverted, um, 
from the point that you had started using our services, and then we are able to translate that using an EPA climate calculator to show how many miles um, uh, of a car not driven that might translate to, or how many tree seedlings might have been planted as a result of capturing those emissions. Um, but again, just like our, our uh, drop-off program, you also get access to those workshops at no cost and discounts on our, uh, our products. And so between our pickup and drop-off program, we're quickly approaching around 2,000 households that are have opted into this program, uh, and we think that we'll be at 2,000 probably by early 2022. Um, and so uh, as we continue to expand our service area and our drop-off locations, um, we're really thrilled to see the level of uptick and reception that these services are, are having with, with households. Um, but, you know, a logical question to ask is, okay, you're picking up food scraps. What do you do with it? So uh, this year we expect that we'll probably end up diverting um, a little over 3 million pounds of food waste from going to landfills. Um, and unlike a recycling company or a landfilling company, um, the final destination for uh, the material we collect is exceedingly important. And so what you see pictured here is on the left our old composting site and on the right our new composting site. Um, these images are to scale, uh, which is to say that we moved from a, a rather modest site to a far more substantial one uh, for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is that we're picking up more food waste. Um, but I think more, more thoughtfully and more intentionally, we saw that there is an incredible opportunity for um, what we call cyclical integration. So a lot of businesses talk about vertical integration where you own the whole supply chain up and down. Well, we're interested in like folding the supply chain back onto itself. Um, and the way that we do that is by capturing food scraps and then turning them into a value-added product. Um, and that value-added product is what we call tilt soil. So it's made entirely from food scraps and wood chips or leaf waste that we get from municipalities. It's made right here in Cleveland. Uh, and it is designed really to provide people with the highest quality soil that we know how to make. Um, and by having a back-end product, we can actually make the accessibility of our services um, more and more ubiquitous. Because if we have products that we can make and sell on the back end, we can eventually uh, lower the cost of our collection services to further and further reduce the barriers to participation um, in our services. And so um, a little fun story about our old site is that we, um, we used to be at East 55th in St. Clair. Um, we were in an old uh, manufacturing warehouse building, and so we were just operating in the parking lot of the that large building. Um, but we um, have always worked very closely with the Ohio EPA because this is the governing body that uh, determines permits and rules and regulations around uh, composting. And so prior to 2017, the state rule uh, stated that any one parcel was able to compost up to 300 square feet uh, of active compost. And so we are very involved in a sort of growing national movement of community composting, as it's called. Um, so there are dozens and dozens of organizations like ours um, that operate in varying ways all over the country. Um, and we, we knew that we need more of this activity taking place. And so we wanted to see more people feel more empowered to do more composting. And so we asked the simple question, why 300 square feet? Um, and we kept asking that question until one day they said, okay, how does 500 square feet sound? Um, and we rejoiced. Um, and so now we, we can sort of brag that we changed a state rule um, in, the, in Ohio that increased the allowable amount of composting from 300 square feet to 500 square feet. Um, but because of the massive amounts of food waste that we were picking up, we were never composting all of the food waste that we uh, were contracted to pick up. We were always partnering with other organizations 
who we would pay a fee to drop material off to, and then they would turn around and make the compost out of it, and then sell that compost. And we thought, hey, that's a pretty good model. I wonder if we could do that. And so we found an underutilized site um, uh, just south. Uh, it's at like 480 and 77. And this location was permitted. We reached out to the permit holders and asked if we could lease their land from them. And much to our surprise, they agreed. And so we've been operating at this new site for about the past year and a half. Um, and by operating here, we're now able to process 100% of the material that we're collecting from our clients and convert that into products that we can then formulate into specialty mixes and blends and then sell. Uh, and it's that kind of synergy and dynamism that frankly is the reason we didn't go out of business during the pandemic. Um, and so just to give you a really brief overview of what composting is, um, we've taken a lot of pride to get as good at this as we possibly can. Um, and I think that uh, composting generally has a fairly poor reputation uh, in part because the people that do it on a large scale are very often like waste management adjacent. These are organizations that say to themselves, well, we demolish buildings and move concrete and rubble and gravel. How hard can composting be? Um, or it's the well-intended home gardener who has a pile of stuff in their backyard and they just keep throwing banana peels and coffee grounds in it and aren't really actively managing their pile and all of a sudden they've got raccoons and it smells. Um, and so, so some of the things that we're trying to do is to sort of um, make people really excited about composting and the way that we think we can do that is by demonstrating best practices um, because a healthy compost pile, um, a healthy composting site should not smell, should not attract pests, and, you know, in our most wild ambitions, we think that communities should be craving compost facilities um, because it's a way to locally manage a resource uh, and then deploy that resource in their community. It keeps resources local, it keeps dollars local, it creates local jobs, and it's creating a natural climate solution in the form of healthy living compost, which has the ability to sequester carbon. So not only are you avoiding the harmful methane emissions that would otherwise have resulted by that material going to landfill, but you're creating a carbon sucking, carbon sequestering tool in the form of compost. And the best way that we know how to do that is by keeping four key elements in mind. So nitrogen should be roughly 40% of your compost pile. Um, nitrogen, in our case, is found in food scraps that we pick up. Um, the other um, 60 to 70% of your pile should be carbon, which uh, is found in the form of wood chips, leaves, sawdust, shredded newspaper, things like this. Uh, if you have those two in balance, um, the next two things that you are optimizing for are to really help encourage the reproduction of microbes. Because compost is a living thing, uh, it needs to both breathe and you need uh, a moisture level that is conducive to microbial reproduction. If it is too wet, you'll get foul odors. If it is too dry, you will have slower or less than optimal microbial reproduction. And if the microbial reproduction and the eating and digesting of this organic matter by microbes that helps to generate heat um, that can help that will help to um, kill off things like weeds, seeds, uh, and diseases that are sometimes persistent in, in much of the material that we're trying to compost. So in, in our case, um, we're able to compost all food scraps. So that includes um, not only fruits and vegetables, but also proteins, small bones, uh, and dairy. Uh, and the reason for that is because we pay such close attention to these four elements uh, and are doing it at such a scale that our piles can reach temperatures in excess of 150 degrees. Um, now, I will say that at the home setting, it's very unlikely that your pile will ever get that hot, but what you do need to make sure of is that your pile is reaching temperatures in excess of 130 degrees. Without exceeding 130 degrees, 
you will not kill off weeds, seeds, or pathogens. And so if any of you have tried unsuccessfully to compost, you may have seen zucchini sprouting or watermelons growing out of it. And that's because the pile uh, that you created did not uh, have temperatures sufficient enough to kill off weed seeds and pathogens. Um, and so it's, it's this sort of dedication to quality assurance, to meticulous practice and, and monitoring um, that last year we were actually named the best small scale composter in the United States by the U.S. Composting Council, which is the national trade organization for the industry that we operate in. Um, but we knew as well that in spite of some of the large numbers that we throw around, um, we are actually not making quite a lot of compost compared to others. Um, so a thing I like to liken us to is like, there's a lot of Budweiser's and Miller Lights uh, out in the world, but there aren't a ton of Great Lakes breweries out in the world. Um, but the quality of between those two products couldn't be any more different. Um, and so we view ourselves as sort of like a craft brewer of compost or of soil. But because we don't have these economies of scale, we needed to take the limited or finite amount of compost that we were making and make that the centerpiece in products that were immediately accessible and understandable to the vast majority of home gardeners, of farmers, uh, and of houseplant enthusiasts. And so we decided that rather than try and sell compost, we should sell soil blends. And so the very first soil blend that we came up with was our product called Sprout, which is our seed starting mix. And so um, if any of you have ever tried growing from seeds um, or know any farmers, the quality of your seed starting mix is um, paramount to having a, a healthy plant in the long term. And so we're really fortunate to have uh, a gentleman on our team named Nathan Rutz. Nathan is a trained soil scientist and has studied um, under a number of soil microbiologists as well as um, done uh, like sh shadowing at some of the very best compost operators in, in the country and has brought that information back to us so that we can be making not only the highest performing quality product that we can, but one that is uh, as sustainable as possible in terms of the amendments and ingredients that we're sourcing into these mixes. And so just as a way of uh, seeing you know, how, how did we do? Um, we responded to an invitation to submit soil samples to this University of Kentucky study that was looking at um, commercially available uh, potting mixes um, across the country. And they concluded that our seed starting mix was among the top three performing uh, products nationally. Um, so for being just, you know, a year into our operations and dialing in our formulation, we think that we, we did a pretty good job. And we continue to solicit feedback and ask uh, many of the farmers and home gardeners that we're selling to to continue to let us know how we can improve and continue to, to work on iterating this process because um, the work of improving and the work of getting a better supply chain is, is one that never ends for us. Um, we can always be doing something better, and we're always really interested to learn because every conversation we have with someone that uses our product uh, illuminates for us either something that we're doing well, something that we can improve upon, um, but the name of the game for us at this moment is just to get more of this product out into the world because we think that, you know, uh, you, have to, you have to really experience a high-quality product to realize just how underserved um, many gardeners are with offerings of products that are currently available at big box stores. Most of the media that is sold at Home Depot and Lowe's is denuded of any biology, of any fungi, um, and is really an inert media um, that um, perhaps not surprisingly then requires things like fertilizers and pesticides to uh, sort of force your plant to grow. We approach our work through a totally different lens, which is natural, healthy, living soil biology can um, provide all of the nutrients you need to your plant roots to create uh, a healthy and, and fruitful uh, plant uh, that we all can enjoy. And so um, it was mentioned earlier, we've got a number of different products for a number of different applications, be it a seed starting mix or a raised bed fill mix. 
We've got a house plant mix, um, and then a mix designed for indoor cultivation as well. And so we've we've this has really been the the outsized focus of our work because we think that if we can get this right and if we can create revenues from the products that we're creating, um, it helps to create a flywheel effect to make our services more and more ubiquitous and accessible. And so, um, so yeah, so we're really, really interested in, in getting these products into the hands of amateur gardeners, talented gardeners, first time farmers, you name it, um, because we, we are very confident in their performance. Um, and we, um, are, are trying to play in a market that is not, uh, that is quite large and not easily disrupted. Um, because I think that a lot of people, don't pay much mind to the soil that they're buying. Um, it's hard to be a knowledgeable or discerning uh, customer when it comes to something as complex as soil. And so um, that's why we love having conversations like this and to talking to garden clubs and to really just um, sharing our story because we, we have found that uh, as soon as people try this stuff, it's kind of hard to go back. And so, um, with that, I'm, I'll wrap it up, but um, yeah, we're, we're doing this work really to advance this idea of the circular economy. Uh, for us, what that looks like is uh, an economy that has designed waste out. Um, and so we think that the food system is, is the most well adapted to be this bastion of what the circular economy can look like, right? I, I dream about a future where all of the food that we grow, if it isn't consumed and distributed in an equitable way, um, must be composted. And after it's composted, that is going right back to the farmers and home gardeners who are growing more food to go right back to our plates to create a more healthy, equitable food system that can combat climate change, that can keep money circulating in our communities, um, and can fend off climate change. So with that, um, my contact information is, is there. Please check out our website, which is rustbeltriders.com, if you're interested in learning more about our pickup or drop-off program. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about our soils, I invite you to check out uh, www.tilthsoil.com. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and chat with you all. Yay. This is this has been again a fabulous presentation. Again, I learn something new all the time. Um, if anybody has a question, you can unmute and uh, ask your question or type it into the chat. Um, I'm going to begin. Um, okay. Maybe as people are thinking, um, do you compost um, things like the the Plastics, well, that are not plastic, but the compostable yeah. plastics and and cups and things like that. Yeah, great question. So yeah, so um, maybe not surprisingly, there's those are growing in in their utilization, um, and I think that we we view them as better than plastic. Um, but what I will say is it it's a it's a bit of a tricky subject for us. So. Um, the direct answer is yes, we can compost them. So if you use our pickup or drop-off service, you absolutely can include any certified compostable product. Um, and we, um, if you have any questions about the product that you're holding or looking at or considering buying, you can always ask somebody on our team and we'll let you know if it is indeed compostable. Um, there's a certification that we um, look for called BPI certified, it's the Bioplastics Industry Certification, that tells us that other composters across the country have worked with this product to no ill effect. Um, what I will say, though, is that um, the soils that we make are all certified organic, um, and as a result, um, there are some feedstocks that can't go into the production of those products and compo certified compostable products are one such product. So we have a um, sort of a generic compost that we make um, that is not technically certified organic. It follows the exact same protocols and procedures as uh, all the tilt soil products, but because it contains in it things like bioplastics, we're not able to uh, 
uh, sell it under the TILF brand or label it as organic. Um, so there's a little bit of push and pull there, um, but at the end of the day, we think that um, minimizing our reliance on fossil fuel-based plastics and moving towards more natural products uh, is a win. And so um, the broader, like the deeper challenge that we offer to people is we shouldn't be moving towards durables, uh, things that are used over and over again instead of one time. And so, um, so yeah, so that's, um, that's my rambling answer to that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, people, use silverware and dishes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, a question came in, do uh, you compost eggshells? Yep, absolutely. So, um, yeah, the, the very broad answer that we give is anything that was recently alive, we can compost. Um, and so uh, recently is like kind of vague, I recognize that, but we really try and keep it simple. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the tools that we make available to all of our pickup or drop-off members is a searchable app that you can access to literally type in, you know, you could be in your kitchen and you can type in, uh, is banana nut bread compostable? Um, and you'll get an answer. Um, we get, we have some of the most curious customers that exist, I think. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, gotten, we've gotten more questions than I can even begin to, uh, to name. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, let, usually we have an answer. Uh, and if we don't, it means you've got a very curious mind. Uh, so, yeah. Do you have a garden? Do I have a garden? Um, I'm a new homeowner, so I just bought a, a house in Shaker. Um, and so I bought it, like, two months ago. And so... I did not get around to establishing a garden in my backyard, but I'm very much looking forward to doing a pollinator garden and a bit of a veggie garden in my backyard this coming season. I have a question. Um, yeah. Is your composting just uh, food, or would you include, like, fall, you know, your fall cleanup where you're, you may have your plants and so forth? Yeah, so what I'll, what I'll, what I would, the way I would answer that is that our services are designed for food scraps. Um, okay. So when we go to our pickup, so if you're a member of our pickup program, we will pick up all the food waste that you generate, but we've, we've been asked many times, can you take my grass clippings or my leaves? And that just requires a different kind of infrastructure than one that we have. Um, and so instead, we try and remain as focused as possible on the food waste while encouraging the municipalities that those people reside in to do things like leaf collection, yard waste collection, because our facility can be a receiver of that material. So we receive all of the leaves and grass clippings from Rocky River. We receive all of the leaves and grass clippings from... Um, some east side communities as well. And so um, so if your municipality does not offer it, I encourage you to reach out to whoever your solid waste uh, director is or facilities director is and let them know that we um, would love to have them come to our facility. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? I think he just got kicked off. Oh, no. Yeah. I was just going to share, though, and too bad he can't hear this comment, but I um, have been a customer of Rust Belt Riders, I think, since June, and have had just an amazing experience with it. Um, we used to keep our own compost in the backyard, and, um, and we had an airtight bucket in the kitchen that we would then transfer the scraps over. And then since, um, uh, Dan, welcome back. I was just saying that I've been a, a yeah, pickup customer of yours. No <laughs> problem. I was just saying I've been a, a pickup customer of yours since about June. Um, awesome. Prior to that, we kept our own compost, and we probably weren't doing it right because it, it would smell every once in a while. And so I was bothering my husband. I'm like, just get rid of this thing. And that's when he found yeah. your service. Um, and I, so I want to personally thank you for that um, bag that you put in <laughs> the container. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it really helps with smell. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So we, I mentioned in the presentation that we're in 
concert and communication with lots of other community composting organizations um, across the country and we always share sort of best practices and um, we initially were using this thing called a bio bag which is like a bioplastic corn based plastic looking feeling kind of thing um, and what we realized is those are expensive um, and they can't go into a certified organic product right and so what we decided to do is that the best compostable bag in our opinion is a paper bag uh, it's like sometimes the simplest solution is the most obvious one too um, and so yeah it saved us some money and it ensured that the material that we pick up from our household members can actually go into these organic products which we're really excited about but yeah it is really little simple things like that that allow us to keep our buckets clean hopefully prevent them from you know accumulating odors over time and makes the process a little bit more enjoyable for the users so yeah well I have one more question sorry I this is kind of business related in a way you know yeah. so many companies now are not getting enough employees how you guys doing okay with employees you got people staying or you got people yeah uh, um, or do you so have volunteers or what yeah, so that's a um, a thing I I probably need to uh, address more directly in our presentation. So one of the things that we really um, are emphatic about is that how we do this work is just as important as the work it is that we're doing. So put another way, we could pay minimum wage and employ robots and automation, um, but we really feel like the kind of place of business that we're creating is is really really critically important and central to our mission and so we have a starting wage of twenty dollars an hour we provide health care and benefits to all of our employees um, and every employee has the opportunity to become an owner of the company after two and a half years of working with us so we want our success should be shared success um, and so we we really want everybody to feel like not only feel like but realize that the rising tide lifts all boats right um, we live in an impoverished community and we feel it is our responsibility to create pathways out of poverty and to create meaningful employment for people in our community and so we've centered that at our work um, from day one um, and I think uh, in large part because of that um, we have not had any challenges with getting employees we have not had any challenges with retaining employees we've got some of the most talented passionate knowledgeable people on our team that live and breathe this and get a great deal of meaning and gratification out of this work right I mean I think that I work with some of the coolest people I know and they you know like none of us could work probably anywhere else right um, I mean that's not true I we, we're, we're all capable talented people but it's this idea that um, our work is very integral to who we see ourselves in the world and and it allows us to sort of not need to check our values at the door when we go into work but instead be able to show up as our full selves um, and and really have your voice heard and have make decisions about do we expand our service area to this community or that community and no one there's no like boss making the decisions right it's always a conversation it's always a dialogue um, because our view is that the more perspectives you can get the better uh, decisions you make Wow and Amazing. the employees are always really friendly um, when I when it, when they oh, he got kicked off again oh bummer um, the employees are always really friendly when they come to pick up the bucket as well um, even when I forget that it's Friday morning and they're coming and I see the van pull up and I scramble to get the bucket and I'm running back out with it um, but I do also want to add that if you forget to leave your bucket out they will leave one we just kind of want to we don't want to collect buckets so and Dan I just made the point that if if you're a pickup customer and you forget to put your bucket out your employees will leave one so you don't have to try and make do with a bucket for another week. Yeah, sorry, I got kicked off again. That's um, okay. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. 
Well, seeing no more questions uh, and seeing that we're nearly at 9 o'clock right now, Dan, I want to thank you so much for, again, all the information. It's amazing that, you know, people just don't think about composting and food waste. And, and it, it really opened my eyes when I first heard your, your presentation. And, uh, again, it just... I, I wish the whole world would, would hear this just because it's, uh, you know, it's amazing that, like you say, there's food insecurity in some places and right around Cleveland, and yet we're wasting 40% of our food. It just, and I have seen that waste uh, happening. So, well, I'm thank you all so much. Again. It's a real I'm honor and pleasure to get to talk with you. Yeah, this, this is fabulous. Thank you so much. You, yeah. you have a good Take evening, care. everybody. Everybody who's joined us, have a great evening. And compost or join Rust Belt Riders. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.